All right, hi everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, for the sake of the camera, this is the San Francisco MySQL Meetup Group. Uh, tonight we have Chris Schneider, he's gonna talk to us about MySQL and Hadoop. Um, our sponsors, as usual, uh, we have IGN, they provided the food and the facilities in my time. Um, we have AppDirect, they provide Aaron's time, our co-organizer. Uh, they also provided a bunch of t-shirts for us to raffle off. Um, so, uh, we don't have anything booked yet for, Dece for January, but we do have December. We're going to have, Pal ah, crud, I can't remember, Palmina? Palomino? Sorry, I butchered that like usual. Um, they'll be uh, coming to talk to us about their product. Um, open, source, open source sharding and clustering. I really should have done my research ahead of time. Anyway, uh, as usual, we give an opportunity for people to speak up if they're looking to, to be hired or looking to hire someone. Um, is there anyone that wants to mention either of those? No? Wow, great. Um, then we're going to go ahead and kick it straight over to Chris and have him tell us about MySQL and Hadoop. Thank you. All right. Hold on. Is this thing on? It is. Awesome. I can hear myself. Let me raise that up a little bit. All right, cool. Um, well, first, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Um, my name is Chris Schneider. Uh, I'm a MySQL guy. I uh, have been for many, many years. A um, little bit about me. I'm a data architect at Ning.com. Uh, you might not know what Ning is. It's build your own social networking. Awesome if you do. Thank you. Um, recently uh, acquired by Glam Media, which is a uh, media, a different like product media company, fashion, that kind of stuff. Um, so hopefully, you know, melding uh, technology with uh, with uh, media companies. Uh, I guess that's what they want to do. Um, basically, I've been a DBA for 10 years, architect, engineer, DevOps, that kind of stuff. Uh, over the last two years, I've spent uh, working with Hadoop specifically. Uh, I have a very small 30 node cluster, about 150 terabyte, uh, smaller clusters, but it is pretty much average size uh, for the industry. It's not like a, a big company like Facebook or, you know, Twitter or something like that, who has, or Yahoo, which has thousands and thousands and thousands of nodes. Um, but it's really cool that, that Hadoop can actually scale up to thousands and thousands and petabytes and petabytes. <coughs> so what Okay. Uh, Hadoop, CDH, does anybody know what CDH is? Does anybody like Cladera? I love Cladera, they're awesome. Um, Cladera is distribution for Apache Hadoop. Uh, some use cases, MapReduce, Scoop, Hive, and Impala. Impala is new, very, very new. Just was introduced uh, at Strata a couple weeks ago in New York. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. So, uh, you know, feel free to ask questions. If you guys need to, or stop me if you want me to go further in depth with anything, uh, I have no, no problem doing that. So uh, I guess before I get to the next slide is, uh, how many people here run Hadoop in their environments? Just a few, okay. Uh, any MapR Java people? Any developers, kind of, not really. One, awesome. So um, how many people are planning to run Hadoop in their environment? Maybe a little bit more hands, right? here. So for everybody who may not know or, or want to know more, Hadoop basically uh, it's this awesome open source framework um, that was based off of Google's GFS, Google file system, uh, you know, basically given to the Apache Foundation under the name Hadoop and it's a way to scale out your data uh, hopefully infinitely. Uh, some of the bigger installations, it seems like it's going to be infinite. Um, it scales linearly, so the more nodes you add, the more you can scale, the faster your MR jobs will go. MR is short for MapReduce. Um, it's absolutely designed for batch processing, but that might not be true with uh, the new technologies that are coming out, uh, like Impala. And then uh, it's optimized for streaming reads. So, CDH is basically, the, there's a company out there called Cloudera. Uh, everybody know the company that used to be MySQL? Um, of course, I hope that you know MySQL. Well, basically, this is uh, 
the big data MySQL equivalent. Uh, they created their own distribution. They have their own documentation. They have their training. They have a very awesome training team. Um, actually, the, a lot of the people from the MySQL training team went over to Cloudera and now train Apache Hadoop. Um, they offer you know, admin training, development training, HBase training, Hive and Peak training, uh, manager training you know, for Hadoop if, if a company wants to use that. They also offer enterprise support, consulting, that kind of stuff. Uh, the reason why I'm bringing them up and the reason why they basically have a whole slide is because they are the only distribution for Apache Hadoop. There's no other distributions out there. There are other companies that do Hadoop, like Hortonworks. They also do training, but they don't actually have their own built-in distribution. So the reason why this is important is because a lot of people don't know where to start, uh, especially coming over from the MySQL world from structured data, and structured data requires structure. Um, well, distributed data doesn't necessarily have structure or really require a lot of structure because you can do whatever you need with it. Um, but Cloudera is really the best place to start as far as I can see in the, in the industry right now. Um, they have a whole uh, distribution that's just filled with RPMs uh, for your name node, for all your different daemons, name node, secondary name node, uh, job tracker, task tracker, data, data nodes. Uh, the advantage to actually going with a distribution is that you don't have to go and download from source from Apache and then compile everything together and then hope it works at the end. And then at the, at the same time, <clears throat> would you really want to be in that situation where you're the only person that has compiled everything and now you're the only one that could support it? Uh, so if you're, if you're really looking for a good place to start, uh, I would start at cloudera.com. And I'll, I'll get in a little bit more uh, when we go into a demo. Uh, basically using Clutter as VM, which is basically a, uh, a practice ground, and the VM is basically the pseudo distributed mode for Apache Hadoop. So I guess, why Hadoop right now? Uh, no data, or uh, no SQL and big data, or all the buzzwords and everything like that. Volume, velocity, variety. Um, basically you can, you can scale it out for petabytes in MySQL you might be able to do terabytes, but you're probably going to have to shard your environment somehow. Um, velocity, I mean, it's, you can ingest terabytes of data a day. Uh, the bigger your system is, the, the more you can ingest. So uh, it's basically automagical sharding. And then variety, you can have you know, structured and unstructured data in there. Uh, structured data is typically going to come from uh, Hive, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, and then on top of Hive would be like Impala, but basically it's a MySQL interface, My, MySQL-like interface into Apache Hadoop. <coughs> so some use cases for Hadoop, and I, I put this one at the bottom uh, recently. I, I'd like to talk about that first. Uh, every, everybody look at the elections, and that was awesome. Uh, well, Nate Silver predicted who was going to win before then. And Nate Silver's kind of with the New York Times, and he did this wonderful data science and aggregation on all 50 states and actually called each of the 50 states before they actually came in. Uh, it pissed a lot of people off that you know, he could actually predict this and they couldn't. Uh, and basically all he said to them was, hey, math works. <laughs> so um, what's funny about that is it, math really does work. And really, th there's, there's two parts of well, actually, three parts of um, uh, Hadoop for me, and, and, and probably other people who have, who have actually uh, been inside of Hadoop and set up Hadoop. You know, there's always going to be operations, and you have to know how to set it up. And then you have to go a little bit further in, in how to configure Hadoop with your XML files and how much memory allocation. It's kind of like, you know, the MyCNF file. Um, there's also this wonderful new thing called data science. And data science is basically what Nate Silver did. And it's all math, and it's all predictions, and it's basically asking the data questions so you can make decisions based off of your data. And that's basically where everybody wants to go. Um, people want to do this with miles and miles and years and years worth of data, though, uh, especially for you know, very large companies. Like, give me a trend that happened, you know, or, or do some sort of trend modeling over the past 10 years instead of the trend modeling over the past like 10 minutes. So some, some good use cases like Netflix recommendations. Uh, a lot of people probably should have Netflix uh, if they don't want to pay for cable. Um, but I mean, all your, all your recommendations basically 
are going to come from Hadoop basically saying, hey, you watch this, here's other movies that are like that to fit that genre and you might like it. Um, same thing with ad targeting. Um, Target.com, maybe you know you go on there, Amazon.com, hey, you were looking for this product and you might want to look for this product too or you might be interested in buying this book if you bought this book. Um, these are all things that, that really come from the big data scene. It's online representations of you based off of the companies giving you ads and, and trying to make you buy stuff like the stuff that you've already purchased. Machine learning and classification, so spam systems. Uh, big, I mean, they're, Yahoo, Yahoo Mail's huge, so you'd have to have a, a, a lot of data to do spam classification. You know, financial identity theft and credit risk. And then you have, you know, the social graph like Facebook, LinkedIn, eHarmony. Um, hey, you might know this person, this person, that person, this person, this all, all this information and all these pointed ads and uh, you know, pointed click on me's are, are coming from big data now. So some details about, uh, about Hadoop itself, it's, it's really two parts. So I, I know before I said like three parts, but it's really three different jobs. It's like there's operations, there's engineering, and then there's the data scientists. Um, I'm hoping to get into all three, but I hate Java, uh, and I don't ever want to write in Java. So I prefer to use Hive or Pig or something else other than Java. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the people who write Java and MapReduce all day long, you guys are awesome, but um, you can keep it. So, but really for Hadoop, there, it's really a two-part system. There's HDFS, which is a, uh, the distributed, Hadoop distributed file system, where all your uh, blocks are stored. And I'll say blocks, you'll understand a little bit uh, on the next slide. Um, it's basically files, but it's, you know, uh, cut up into blocks. Um, and then you have your, uh, the way to access it, which is MapReduce. So there's just, you know, map task, there's a reducer task. Um, you know, map, mapping is basically for searching, reducing is basically for aggregate. So to put that in MySQL EEs, it'd be like select all from world.city. Uh, that's a map task only. Select all from world.city order by ID. That would be a map and reduce. So that, I'll actually visualize that in a, in a little bit as well. Um, so it also has built in redundancy to Hadoop. Uh, as far as hardware is concerned, every block is replicated uh, by default three times unless you change it. So it'll be on three separate nodes. And I do mean blocks because if you have, let's say, uh, a 64 megabyte file that actually equates to one block inside of HDFS. Uh, if you have 128, then that's two blocks. And then you're actually going to have that 64 megabyte representation of like, let's say that 64 megabit one file. That representation of that file is actually going to be replicated to three different data nodes, hopefully on three different racks if you have rack awareness set up. Um, if you have 128, then basically you're going to have that file, but it's going to be six different blocks on six different nodes or you know, at least three different nodes for each block. So also failed, uh, failed MapReduce tasks, they, they'll restart automatic, automatically. Um, if something happens to a data node or task tracker halfway through, if something happens in the shuffle and sort phase, um, Hadoop's smart enough to realize that, okay, this, this failed, I'm just going to go to the next server over where I haven't done any processing yet, where that block exists and just pick it up so you don't actually have to deal with failures like that. It's already built into the system. So this is a very crude model of what I was just saying. Uh, this basically outlines uh, most of the daemons on here. The only one that I don't see is, well, only two, is going to be like the secondary name node. Um, how many people think the secondary name node is a failover name node? Absolutely not. <laughs> it's, a, it's just a, a checkpointing node. For the, for the name node. So it's a very terrible name. So if you ever see a secondary name node, don't think it's like a, a, a slave of anything that you can fail over to. Um, so that was more back in, in the CDH3 days. Now in CDH4, they actually have a failover master node. Um, but that's uh, orthogonal to the secondary name node. So the name node's at the very top. The job tracker's at the top as well. These are daemons. So then you have the big boxes are going to be basically your your task trackers and data nodes. Those are two daemons that basically run on all of your data nodes. 
task trackers always check into the job tracker. And the client, when it wants to go access some of the files in HDFS, it goes to the job tracker uh, while all the task trackers are checking into it and basically says, hey, do you have, the task tracker will say, hey, do you have any work for me? And then if there's no work, then the job tracker says, nope. And then the second the client comes in and says, I want to work with this file. Task trackers will come in and say, hey, I have this block, this block, this block. Do you have any work for me? The job tracker says, yes, start working. Uh, here's your map and reduce. And it basically points the client down to uh, the, the data node, the task tracker, and they start working on these files uh, in a map reduce way, which we'll get into here next. Any questions? Not yet. So word count is, uh, I guess, very prevalent inside of MapReduce. Why would you want to do a word count? Well, maybe it's not a word. Maybe it's an IP address that you're looking for. Maybe you have a whole bunch of web servers. And your system's continually being attacked from wherever. And you know where the IP, you know, the IP is, and you want to trend like when this person is coming online, so you maybe you know, have to set up a firewall rule or, or get, get a security expert on, onto your network so they can uh, you know, actually go out and find what's going on. <clears throat> so you have, like, let's say, uh, all, on all your uh, Apache servers, Apache has logs and access logs and security logs. So, and they have Flume set up that automatically take your, uh, your logs over into the Hadoop cluster. So you would run a word count uh, on, on those logs inside of HDFS to find you know, how many times and, and what frequency an IP address showed up on your network. Um, so the uses for this are, you know, I wouldn't say endless, but I mean, you can find a lot of really cool information with it. So everything is stored in key value inside of HDFS. The key is the byte offset, and the value is basically the line of a file. Um, so <clears throat> let's go to, so just a map using search. So we have a 64 and then big data is totally cool and big. Uh, this is a very, very horrible way <laughs> to, to kind of show MapReduce because it's really only uh, one line, one file, one key, one value. Uh, but it, it does illustrate the point. So um, basically for each word inside of that entire file, I'm going to say, um, my inter intermediate output is going to be, you know, big data is totally cool and big. So big in there comes up twice. So the reduce uses a, a, an aggregate and actually takes uh, all of the data, the, the, especially the two bigs, and groups them together and says, okay, I have two occurrences of big, so there's two occurrences of big here, and then one occurrence of all the other, um, uh, I'm sorry, all the other words. Uh, and then basically pushes it into a list and says, okay, nobody wants to count all the ones out and basically says, okay, big, two, data, one, and so on and so forth. And that's the reduce phase. And I mean, that's very, very simply what MapReduce is. Uh, and then it, re it will return uh, those values to the client uh, that's asking the question. So where does Hadoop fit in? Um, Hadoop is absolutely an augmentation for a MySQL, any data shop. Um, you want to store years of data. <coughs> uh, you need to aggregate data over many, many years. Um, so I, I guess a really good, uh, a good way to say, you know, where does Hadoop fit in? Uh, I think that we've all had the environment where, or maybe we all have had the environment where, you know, I really want to store, or this customer really wants to store the last 30 days or the last six months worth of data, and then after six months I really don't care, or the customer doesn't care about that data, so we need to put that data somewhere. So typically that would go into an OL, OL AP, uh, you know, data store or something like that. Well, now you can just throw it over into Hadoop and kind of keep it forever as long as you can keep scaling out your data nodes. Um, this is kind of where Hadoop is starting to fit in. Uh, Absolutely, when you want to aggregate all that data for years and years and years and years, like what was the trend last year for Target.com and this year, what's the new hottest toy or whatever. Um, and then when you want free software that can actually scale on commodity hardware. Uh, and I do say commodity, not cheap. Um, I mean, it's, you still have, you, we don't, you know, uh, with, with your data nodes, it's just a bunch of disks. Like you don't want RAID. 
uh, necessarily, but I have seen companies actually, you know, put in RAID because they didn't want to have to deal with those, you know, data nodes going down, then all the blocks would have to get replicated over to another data node. Um, commodity hardware is like, you know, your typical 16 core or uh, 8 core, 16 gig of RAM, and that's a little high, uh, you know, one terabyte, just a bunch of disks. Uh, you can, you know, label your disks off and basically say, you know, blocks on D1, D2, D3, D4, uh, and then just keep on going. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily cheap hardware, but it's not like really expensive hardware. So where does Hadoop fit in? Again, this is kind of a visual representation. Uh, it's really red. Um, basically, there's your Apache, MySQL, Scoop, ETL, both out and in. Um, you have Flume. Does anybody know what Flume is? It's a log aggregator that throws you know, log files into Hadoop. Um, works really well. Uh, they actually did a revamp of Flume not too long ago, and now it works even better. Uh, and then you have Hive and Pig over there. Um, and then CDH4 right here, you get your two name nodes basically, secondary name node, job tracker, and all your data nodes, and data nodes pretty much are task trackers as well. Um, so that's basically what I see when I see Hadoop. Data flow, um, MySQL uses you know, OL, OLTP processing. Maybe you want the last 30 days. Uh, maybe you want the last six months. Maybe you want you know, uh, whatever can fit on two nodes two shards, whatever, and then push everything else off into Hadoop. So you ETL some, you know, some, some of your data off onto Hadoop. Uh, you can use Scoop. You can have a cron job with custom ETL scripts. I actually had to write my own ETL script because we had to push it into different places and Scoop didn't necessarily accommodate uh, at the time and we never went back to change it because it works. Um, <coughs> so. And then uh, after you ETL everything over into Hadoop, you're going to you know, transform that data in some sort of batch processing, ask the data questions, get, get answers back from it, uh, run, al run a, uh, analysis on it, you know, join data, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can uh, export that OLAP data back into MySQL, or you can have it sent out in a report, whatever you want to do with that data. Um, I actually have a, a system that will um, go from uh, MySQL to, you know, basically follow this data flow process, uh, pull, f uh, pull data back out, and then import it back into MySQL. So uh, marketing and management, they can have a dashboard that day uh, that they can click around on and see reports, multiple reports. So the differences between MySQL and Hadoop, data capacity, uh, you know, MySQL definitely, if, if you're getting up into terabytes, um, you might run into some limitations. Uh, terabytes inside of Hadoop is actually very small. Um, data per query, uh, it really depends on what you're doing. You can go from megabytes to gigabytes, excuse me, inside of, uh, of MySQL, but in Hadoop you can go all the way up to petabytes. Uh, you can do read and write uh, in MySQL, Hadoop. So, uh, it's only uh, sequential scan. Well, it's, uh, it's, uh, excuse me, sequential scans and append only, so you can't like update rows. Um, MySQL S is SQL, uh, ANSI standard, and then uh, MapReduce scripting, streaming, Hive, Pig, Latin. Uh, it is called Pig Latin, and it's actually reverse set theory. It's kind of weird. Um, transactions for MySQL, not for Hadoop. Indexes, yes, for MySQL, not for Hadoop. Um, usually I would get a question right now, would say, you know, how do you get around indexes inside of, you know, how do you make uh, Hadoop go faster? Well, you can always partition out your data instead of having an index and run, you know, multiple MR jobs or, you know, multiple maps, multiple reducers, uh, you know, to kind of speed things up. But then again, Hadoop really isn't made for speed yet. And I do say yet because Impala just came out a couple weeks ago. Um, Latencies in sub-seconds for MySQL, hopefully not in the minutes, because that would really suck. Um, in Hadoop, minutes to hours, it, it, it really is batch processing on, on tons and tons and tons of data. Um, you know, we have relational for MySQL, non you know, both structured and unstructured for Hadoop, and then you have enterprise, yes, yes on both. 
You can always buy enterprise support from Oracle for MySQL, and you can buy enterprise support from like Hortonworks or from Cloudera for Hadoop. So one of the tools that was mentioned earlier was Scoop. Has anybody used Scoop? Uh, are you using NODB as well? Would you think of it blowing out your buffer pool? Is that awesome? Um, Scoop is a great tool, and it has a lot of usage, uh, and it's, it's really robust, and it can do a lot of cool things. Um, it is optimized for MySQL. Uh, but not performance inside of MySQL. It's like doing a MySQL dump uh, and blowing out your entire buffer pool and uh, doing that in your MySQL database, especially on like a read server or something that's hot. Uh, it's not necessarily the best thing in the world. So use at your own risk. You might want to you know, have an ETL slave that you're, that you're using Scoop on. Um, it's open source, or it's open source, um, and it stands for SQL to Hadoop. Um, the default implementation is JDBC, so you really do, you have to go out and download the connector J and put it in uh, user lib, scoop lib. Um, that's kind of something that's very important, especially with uh, the VMs that come from Cloudera, uh, because they actually, they actually don't ship the JDBC driver with the VM, so you have to go download that afterwards to make sure your scoop works from MySQL over to uh, Hadoop or Hive. Uh, yeah. So, Scoop data into Hadoop. Scoop's really cool because you can like, you know, take city. Has everybody worked with a world database? Because that's, I still use the world database. Um, uh, it's, it's a lot like MySQL dump. You can, you know, have a where clause. You can take columns that you want that you don't, you know, and, and terminate them uh, however you want and delineate however you want. Uh, and then throw it into a, a hive meta store or just a file that you want to, you know, do searching on or MR on. Um, so this command basically, you know, it'll submit a Hadoop job that queries MySQL, uh, reads the city table, and then delineates it and pushes it over into HDFS. Um, the result's a TSV file. Um, some scoop features. Uh, just like I said, there's a where. It has control parallelism, so it can be fast uh, if you have enough cores. But again, you know, you have to you know, be very careful with your, especially with NODB, if you're blowing out your buffer pool, your key buffer, or whatever. Uh, key buffer MySAM. Um, you can do incremental loads, um, and then what's really cool about Scoop as well is that it does integrate right with Hive, so you don't have to go in and create uh, a Hive table and then do a Scoop into that table. Uh, Scoop will actually just take care of that for you, and we'll get into that when we get to the demo. Uh, then Scoop export, you know, taking stuff out of uh, HDFS back into MySQL. Basically looks like this, the, the reverse uh, of what we just did. Um, you know, dumps it out, CSV formatted, single table. Um, Hive is a awesome tool created by Facebook, uh, given over to the Apache Hadoop Foundation. Um, Hive is somewhat dangerous just because you can use SQL and then you'll start getting developers that, you know, know SQL but they don't necessarily know MapReduce. Uh, and then they can do really, really awesome queries that take days and days and days and days. And then it comes back because they're like, hey, this, is, this MySQL query is taking days to run. It's like, well, you just ran a query on like 18 petabyte worth of data. Um, so Hive is awesome because you can use SQL or HiveQL to access your data. Uh, it's, it's a little bit dangerous because it, it does allow pretty much everyone who knows SQL to use that data, but that's why it was invented. because you know, get, getting, getting a Java developer who knows Java really well, who can write MapReduce jobs um, and understand, you know, how to ask questions of the data, uh, that's a pretty, pretty unique skill set. Um, finding a DBA or a developer that knows SQL that can, you know, you know just write a simple SQL statement and uh, look up on petabytes worth of data, a lot of people know SQL. So, I mean, that's really why Hive was invented. Um, it's a great tool, but it's, it's not a replacement for MySQL, but some people tend to start thinking that it is. Um, <clears throat> we'll get into it later, but now there's Impala that sits on top of Hive. And Impala actually is, um, and I do say it sits on top of Hive because you need Hive to actually run Impala as well. Uh, Impala actually does make it more like a database because instead of taking minutes for your MR or HiveQL jobs to finish, now it can take seconds. So now we're getting a lot closer to real time. Uh, 
So Hive, again, is open source. It comes with a VM. Uh, it's really easy to install. Uh, but when you do install it, don't leave it on. It's, it's, uh, there, there's a, a certain database that it comes with. Um, switch it over to MySQL and make sure that, you know, this is, I guess, just a little tip. Make sure uh, it's, it's active inside of MySQL, not the, the default uh, database that they ship it out with, which basically holds your Metastore. Uh, you want it to be MySQL, so uh, bad things don't happen with memory. Um, so again, Facebook uses it. They developed it. Um, and, and again, with HiveQL, it's, it's really a sub-language uh, sub of SQL. It's not full SQL, uh, it's, it's not like you don't have all of the functionality that you, that you do inside of MySQL that you, you know, that you would want necessarily in HiveQL. It's, it's really a subset. So um, working with Hive is really, uh, if you find out what Hive is not good at um, or what Hive can't do, uh, then that's really good. I mean, uh, it, it's really just a subset of SQL, but it's getting more robust, uh, especially in 4.1. Uh, again, <laughs> Hive is really not a replacement for RDBMS. Um, I guess the second point is, is semi semi uh, incorrect because I'm saying I'm saying there that you know Hive is an interpreter that converts HiveQL to MapReduce. It really doesn't create any MapReduce uh, job at all. And normally I would get the uh, well, if I'm doing HiveQL and it converts something to MapReduce, why can't I go see the, uh, the MapReduce jobs? Uh, it actually creates uh, procedural Java code, and then it basically uh, feeds that into uh, HDFS, and then uh, however they want to do uh, I, I don't actually, uh, actually, hold on. The, it, it changes it into procedural Java code, uh, not actually MapReduce, and then uh, goes out to HDFS and, and, and brings the, uh, the information back. But it's, it's actually not MapReduce that it's creating. Like somebody would want to go in and say, hey, I want to go look at HiveQL, see what, see what uh, HiveQL is actually creating. It's not a good way to learn MapReduce because it really isn't MapReduce. Um, HiveQL queries can take you know, many seconds to minutes uh, to produce results. Um, not necessarily true anymore with Impala. Uh, so RDBMS versus Hive, uh, language transaction, ACID, uh, latency, and updates. So um, I don't want to read it to you. I mean, basically, it's everything that you can do with RDBMS, you really can't necessarily do with Hive. Subset of SQL, no transactions, no ACID compliance. Um, latency is higher. And then you have insert overwrite, but that's basically uh, drop table and then create it again. Uh, so Scoop and Hive together, there's one thing right here, Hive import. Uh, that's what I was saying, like, you don't actually need to create the table uh, before you put in the data with, with uh, the Hive import flag here. Uh, Hive will actually do that for you, or Scoop will actually do that for you. So Impala, it's new, it's fast, it's based off of Google's Dremel. Uh, I think everything good with big data is coming out of Google, uh, which is great. Um, it runs on top of Hive. Uh, it's basically for real-time analytics, very large data uh, sets. So uh, who did that today? It was uh, Weeby Data actually uh, just said today that they're going with Impala and, and uh, was it their ClickView product uh, to do real-time analytics on big data for clicks, uh, which is really cool. Um, there's a couple URLs on here. Uh, you can actually play around with the new VM uh, that Cloudera has uh, on Impala. And then I'm going to do a live demo. Uh, are there any questions before the live demo? None? One? So it speeds up high FQL. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so something that you used to be able to do in Hive that would take minutes, now in Impala would take seconds. So I don't actually have a live demo on, um, on Impala. And if my screen comes back up, I do have a live demo uh, on the stuff that I just talked about. If that comes up. And black screen.
So um, this is the 4.1 uh, VM from Cladera. Uh, you can go download it from cladera.com. Uh, they have you know, a whole bunch of different uh, VMs that you can actually use. And uh, this one's with Fusion for Mac, but they have other versions that you can use as well. Um, if you haven't seen anything as far as Hadoop before, <coughs> uh, this is basically your start page. Uh, you can look up here, uh, was it 50,070? Uh, this is a, the name node for Hadoop. And uh, this is in what's called pseudo distributed mode. So all of, your, all of the actual daemons are running on this box. Um, we can actually look at that through here. Uh, J. So look at my Java processes. You have um, a whole bunch of really cool Java processes here. And there's a name node, which is basically what we're looking at here. This is basically you know, configured capacity, which is you know, the rest of my hard drive, basically, if I wanted to use it. Um, DFS used, non-DFS used, um, percent DFS uh, used, DFS remaining, uh, live nodes, dead nodes. Um, in, a, in a larger environment, you'd see a lot more nodes here, and that wouldn't say localhost. Um, and then you actually see DFS used, and you know, a little purple bar would say, you know, how, how much data is actually residing on these data nodes. Um, and you would have dead nodes and decommissioned nodes. Um, what's, what's really cool about this is that you can actually browse the file system from here. Uh, so you can actually browse HDFS. Um, so if you wanted to do like, something like this from the command line, it would be Hadoop uh, FS minus LS. Uh, and now we can go and you know, look at Hadoop. And it's basically the same thing that we're looking at uh, here, temp user var. Um, so here's Hive. Uh, basically, I'm just kind of digging in this because I want to. I want to get just a little bit into Hive with you guys. Um, Hive is really cool. Uh, we can enter it through the command line. There's also uh, the, a hue interface, uh, beeswax interface that we can go through. Uh, that's GUI based, um, but we're MySQL people, so we like the command line. So we can do like show databases. <laughs> and databases inside of Hive are actually directories in HDFS. So we have default right here. Um, we can do like, uh, uh, let's create a table, I don't know, an ID table. And it's going to have one column, and it's going to be an integer. So we'll just go ahead and create our table. We can come back into here, do a refresh. And now, inside of Hive, we have our ID table. And that's basically just a directory inside of HTFS. But we just created a table inside of Hive. So um, if we wanted to put something, let's say, in, into Hive, we can do something like uh, ID TXT. And we can do like 1, 2, 5, whatever. Let's kind of mix that up. All right, cool. So we just have a simple file, a bunch of numbers. Uh, this is very, very simple. And we can do uh, Hadoop FS put. And then we would have to go into the user Hive Metastore. Metastore. And then the ID table that we just created. Um, Uh, Meta T store, cool. Meta store ID, and then we would put in the file, which is um, ID. Whoops, I'm backwards. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, What did I do before? Yeah, that should have been right. Metastore ID. Oh, let's see what I did wrong here. Uh, Hadoop FS put. Yeah, I was right the first time. I 
user hive. Yeah, that's right. Warehouse. Sorry. What's that? Ew, A -E -R. Whoops, I'm glad you guys can see. So cool, um, now that's over. Uh, now we can go refresh. We're gonna have something inside of ID now, and there's ID.txt with all of our numbers. Um, you can't actually edit data from within the file browser, uh, which is good, <laughs> I think, but uh, <coughs> we can go and uh, run SQL on that. So if we do like uh, select all from ID, uh, it'll create our procedural MapReduce and then spit out everything. Um, so notice how uh, in, my, in the next query, um, that was just a map job, so it didn't have any reduce because we weren't aggregating anything. Uh, we can do order by ID and basically a whole bunch of uh, really cool stuff will come out and it'll actually um, also come out inside of what's called the job tracker. So we hope, unless it's already retired, maybe it's not. Doesn't have any running jobs right now, which is weird. Maybe it just got too fast. I'm not quite sure why it's not showing up in the job tracker right now. Um, all right, so let's get on to the, you know, I guess there's map and reduce. Uh, scooping data from MySQL over into Uh, so I have this great demo, and basically here's our scoop lines. And what I want to do is I want to take, I want to import the city database, and I want to do a Hive import into our Hive instance here, and it'll go and connect to MySQL and say, hey, give me everything from city. Um, I need that over in a file and put the intermediate data in user root temp, I think. Uh, and then basically say, now I have all the data, I need to go create the, the actual table inside of Hive. It'll create that table for me and then dump all that data inside of uh, uh, the Metastore. <coughs> and it does take a while. Batch processing. Uh, so let's do the same thing with country. So while that's loading, um, again, we can actually go look at Hive uh, and you know, write all your SQL in here as well. Uh, select all from ID and execute. Um, and there you go, there's your key, there's your value uh, for everything. Uh, Null is basically, uh, if you guys notice, there was like an empty space at the last line. Uh, Hive will do this uh, because it doesn't want to return bad data, uh, especially when you're running very, very long and very, very, uh, you know, uh, aggregated data sets. Uh, if Hive comes across something that is incorrect, it's, you're usually going to see null. 
uh, because it doesn't. It wants to give you back something. It doesn't just want to fail like a, with an error or an exception or something like that. It wants to actually give you something back, and you know you really have to look uh, through your data or just make sure or know how to scrub your data out. So let's see if that finished. Yay, it finished. Um, so now we can do Hadoop FS LS and then uh, whatever user hive. Uh, warehouse. And then you have city and country right there. Uh, those are directories and then the actual tables are going to be represented underneath them. So if I go look at city, uh, it's going to have multiple files in 32K blocks, 30, yeah, around 32K blocks. Um, basically it chunked out the entire city table and then uh, made all those chunks into blocks. But when I do a select uh, on the parts, it's actually the whole table. So and then every single one of these blocks will be represented on, you know, on, a, on a real Hadoop node. Uh, three times within the distributed environment. So if we go back into what we're going to do with the demo, um, you know, basically, uh, let's, I guess, cat it out. Paste. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of awesome data that nobody's really going to ever use uh, unless they go into Hive. Um, let's say we want to, you know, run one of our old, very, very old queries on this. We'll go into Hive and then uh, we'll see what we can do with it. <coughs> so instead of having to write a MapReduce job to get the information that I want, which is uh, the sum of the population by country, you know, uh, country code, sum of the population uh, from city where population is greater than 100,000, uh, and I want to group by country code. Everybody's probably seen this before if you use the world database or if you've ever taken a MySQL certification uh, test. Um, it does take a little while. Uh, we're doing map and reduce because we're ordering, we're doing some aggregation. So it's too bad I don't have Impala loaded on here because we, I would have been able to do like uh, differences in speed. But so, what's that? Yeah. Yeah, in the in the browser, I don't know why. Um, right, right, right. So that's something I wanted to to show as well. I'm not quite sure why. It's not coming out. Um, I mean, we can go troubleshoot it, but I'm sure you guys wouldn't want to <laughs> stay here while I'm doing that. So um, that's kind of it for you know MySQL for or Hadoop for MySQL people. It's something that that we're all starting to, or at least a lot of us are starting to use to augment our our career. Big data is here; it's here to stay. Um, it's only getting faster, and it's only getting bigger. Um, so this is just you know a couple ways that you know MySQL people can you know start using and augmenting. Uh, their tool set with Scoop and with Hive uh, into big data. So if there's no questions, or are there any questions, question. Do you have uh, any knowledge about uh, uh, Amazon's managed? Elastic? Data? Elastic yeah. MR? A little bit, yeah. Any uh, words of advice before going down that path? Um, I guess watch how much data that you're actually aggregating and then pulling out of uh, Elastic. Like if you have your Colo somewhere and you're just using you know Elastic MR for Amazon uh, to push a bunch of data up. Um, you just want to watch your transfer rates in between because sometimes that can get expensive. And can I install Impala in Hive or do those have to run on? <coughs> so uh, as far as uh, as far as Hive is is concerned inside of uh, Elastic EMR, I'm not quite sure. Um, I've only uh, I've only had one installation of Elastic MR, and I just made sure that it was up and running, and I didn't have to write any MR with it. It wasn't one of the, uh, one of the requirements, so I didn't have to load Hive or something like that on top of it. Um, I'm, 
I would imagine that you can use Hive inside of uh, Elastic uh, Amazon uh, or Elastic MR, but um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, as far as Impala, it's a few weeks new, so I'd be really surprised if Amazon had it. Right. Um, but, uh, and if they do, I mean, or if they don't get it, uh, they'll probably have it soon. Any other questions? Uh, oh yeah, so uh, I guess the question is um, if, you, if you have a data set that, that does change every now and then, how would you handle that as an ETL inside of Hadoop? Drop and recreate. I mean, that's really the only way that you can do it. Um, that's how Hadoop works. Another question? HBase is awesome. Uh, it's really fast. It's really great. Um, there's a lot of studies out there that uh, you know, are championing it. Uh, a lot of companies are using it. Uh, I have not actually had an HBase install myself, um, nor have I had time to actually learn it. But uh, that's you know one of the other things inside of big data is that there's so many of them now. Like I mean, Mongo. You have Redis. You have uh, Vertica. You have all these things that are you know MapR, whatever. Uh, that you can do. Um, basically, I've just been doing Hadoop, not HBase. Uh, but if you need speed and you need, um, <coughs> uh, was it, I guess, more database like attributes, like you can actually replace stuff, not just append only, um, you'd want to use HBase. So, uh, so MR jobs, they're 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 running in parallel. Yes. So there's not there's not already another one running. It's it, it's oh this this failed on this task tracker. I I know about that. Uh, now I got the failure to the job tracker. And job tracker says okay, well that other block is over here. Go work. Right. Any other questions? Yep. So as far as upgrading from like Apache over to Cloudera, uh, I don't, I haven't had that experience yet. Uh, as far as upgrading from CDH like two to CDH three, um, I have, I, I have had that experience. Um, Make sure you finalize everything after you absolutely are sure that everything is uh, Make sure that you're, you know, if you're using uh, something special, some native library that, you know, uh, was, was specific to CDH2, that you upgrade that to CDH3. Because um, if you start writing from like a CDH2 to a CDH3 uh, and then you need to fail back, uh, your data is going to be messed up. So it's, it's really, I mean, the, you have to be very, very meticulous. So the last company I worked at, we had a, a Hadoop cluster that recorded different events and games. Mm -hmm. And each event had its own ID and whatnot. And we were, you know, recorded a line of data for everything. But they chose to do it all in one big table instead of one table per event. Is there a reason that they did that? One table per event? Yeah, per event type. It would seem logical to They're pretty smart, though. I think there's a reason that I'm not understanding. I, I would wonder, like, why would it matter um, if you have multiple tables? Like, it, like, let's say, you know, event A, you know, user goes into room. You know, that's, that would be an event. And then user comes out of room would be another event. And you, you're wondering why uh, event one and event two weren't in its own separate table. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Okay. I, I mean, it's... 
I wouldn't say six to one half dozen to the other at that point. It's, it's you know, did they test with, I mean, were they using Hive? Because you say table instead of Hadoop, it doesn't yeah, make sense. Yeah, so if it's, if it's maybe it, it, it didn't matter at that point because they were just, for whatever reason, they didn't want to join a whole bunch of different tables. Okay. Yeah. I guess you can have a lot of events inside of games. Yeah. So any other questions? All right, guys. Thank you. I'll be around. <laughs>